Um, let, let's go to God in prayer before we start class. <clears throat> Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you uh, once again for all these things that we're studying that, that really just all brought about the events that, that took place with your son. And dear Father, we just marvel at your hand in history and how they brought about so many things that are important to us as Christians today. And dear Father, we just, we pray that we can always be reminded that, that there's never a period of silence where you're not working and not present, but you're, you're always working and you're always behind the scenes <clears throat> and that you're, you're working, dear Father, to bring about the will, uh, your will and to, and to bring about those that, that, you know, to help those that, that aren't saved to be, to be, um, to be found, to, to, be, to, to find salvation through your son Jesus. We, we know that, <clears throat> that that's what you want, and you want us to, to spread that word and spread that gospel. And, and dear Father, we, just, we thank you for your timing. We ask that you help us to be patient in our lives today as we look forward to your coming again. Um, dear Father, help us to have hope and courage, and, 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 and most importantly, dear Father, we pray that we have the faith that we should have as your, Christ, as your, as your disciples and as your children. <clears throat> we thank you for this class. We thank you, dear Father, for the leaders and the elders here, and we just pray you bless them. Now watch over us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, just a slight correction. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that we talked about last time, we talked about the... Among other things, we talked about the, the evolution of the beginning of the Sadducees and Pharisees. And, and although there are other sects, but you know, those are the two main sects that are gonna, that are gonna comprise, for the most part, the, the Sanhedrin, this, this group of, this meeting place, this group of elders that, that will, by the time the New Testament comes around, will, will reach the zenith of their power. And I mean, they were in essence a Jewish Senate. So we talked a little about that. We'll review some of that. <clears throat> But we talked about, of course, you know, the, what instigated this division, what instigated um, the, uh, you know, this, this, you know, one particular group that's going to embrace Hellenism, one that's going to kind of push it aside and, and, and want to stay true to, you know, Jewish law. Um, <clears throat> and we, we, of course, we talked about that really being the, the uh, you know, this, and Antiochus and others, Antiochus the third, Anti and Antiochus the fourth, Epiphanes, are going to make you know are going to really make it their goal to Hellenize Jerusalem. And we we talked about a couple of individuals. <clears throat> so at the time of the Maccabean conflict, who can tell me who the chief priest was, who the high priest was, and and uh, and his lineage? That's kind of that that requires a little bit of study. And so I, I won't be disappointed if you don't know that, but, but can you remember that family name? It starts with an O? Onias, yeah. So that's the, that's the chief priest. That's the high priest. These, he was of the, it, what's interesting is, do you know where his direct lineage is from? Do you remember, if you go back to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel came back to uh, Jerusalem and along with the high priest, was his name? Yes, his name was Yahshua. And, um, and so Onias was going to be a family that's direct lineage to, back to Yahshua, uh, Joshua, the, 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 the high priest that came back with Zerubbabel. <clears throat> and, and we had some great classes talking about just how, uh, you know, jo Yahshua having that name being set out as a high priest uh, in that respect was, there's a lot of, that wasn't by accident. <clears throat> okay, so we mentioned that Antiochus IV, okay, he's the bad guy. He's going to uh, be jockeying for position and uh, he's, he's going to, at one point, he's going to go to Egypt. And we have the introduction of this event in about 167 or so. He's going to go to Egypt, and he's going to go with a great army, and he's going to confront uh, the Egyptians. And the Egyptians had a, a, a little something in their back pocket. They had made an alliance with this growing republic called Rome. 
And, uh, <clears throat> and so Antiochus IV is going to go. He's going to bring all of his army. And, and lo and behold, there's a small contingent of Roman soldiers that show up in support of Egypt. Remember, we're, we're not far from the time period of Julius Caesar. You know, Julius Caesar, um, of course, is, is going to be the one that really reaches out and embraces Egypt at, through a marriage. And, and remember, Julius Caesar is going to marry a woman of the Ptolemy line. And who was that? Julius Caesar is going to marry Cleopatra. Cleopatra was of the Ptolemy line. Of course, that was a great alliance because Egypt was, at that time, the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. It was a huge uh, production of food sources and all, all these things. So, and at this time, there was a huge population of Jews in Egypt. Um, <clears throat> so he's going to confront them, and basically this Roman commander is going to go and basically tell him, if you attack Egypt, you've basically, um, you've basically declared war against Rome. <laughs> and so it was a humiliation to Antiochus IV. He was humiliated. And, uh, and so guess where he goes right after that? He goes to Jerusalem. So if you wonder why Antiochus Epiphanes was so just violently uh, <clears throat> antagonistic to the Jews, well, there's several things. Number one, when he was in Egypt in this conflict, which really wasn't a conflict, word got around in Jerusalem <clears throat> that Antiochus had been killed. And there were huge celebrations. And, um, <clears throat> and at that time, there was this, the, the brother of Onias, his name was Jason. Remember, we, remember what, was, what was, that was his Greek name? Remember we mentioned Jason was the Greek. The, what's the, what was his Hebrew name? His name was Joshua. <laughs> Lots of Joshua's tonight. So, uh, so, so he takes control He's the brother of Onias, so he is of the line. He's the same line. He's going to take control. And when Antiochus finds out that they've been throwing celebrations in Jerusalem over his surmised death, that's when he comes in and, of course, institutes that reign of terror over Jerusalem. He's going to remove Jason, and he's going to install someone else, and his name is Muleus. And what I mentioned to you last class is that it's, it's, it's upon him when he takes over. And remember, Jason and Malaeus, they, they keep jockeying to Antiochus, I can do better for you. I can make Jerusalem more Greek. I can get you more tribute. Well, Malaeus was the worst. I mean, he, was, he basically sat by and watched when Antiochus completely... Um, of course, uh, does what he does in the temple. I mean, he was an awful guy. But Antiochus makes him high priest. And when he does that, that is the first time in the, the history of Israel that a non-Levite becomes high priest. <laughs> okay. And what I said er erroneously is that when the Hasmoneans come into play, that there, well, there, there still is a lot of debate as to whether the Hasmoneans were, in fact, of Levi descent. There was, remember what I said, when, that, when the Hasmoneans come in and they take over, they were not well liked by a lot of Jews because many of the people they were killing were Jews, many, the, many Jews that had become very Hellenized. So there was a, a, lot, of, a, a lot of controversy in that respect, but so... I, I told you in class that I did not think that the Hasmoneans were, in fact, legitimate high priests. Well, there are many people who believe that, but I, I believe, according to some research and some articles I found, that that may not be true. They, there, there are many that argue that they are of the priestly line of Zadok. So, I did not want that to go um, uncorrected. I know you guys were worried about that. Yeah. I know you guys <laughs> probably wrote that down. No, he was wrong. He was wrong on that. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got, I just, you know, I wanted to make sure I got that off my chest. 
there, it's really interesting the Hasmonean period because you know we're 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 about to get into the introduction of the Romans into this whole story. Um, don't forget that you know a lot of things are happening in the second century BC. Second century BC, there are wars going on in Rome, and they're, they're the Punic Wars. I don't know if you remember those from history, but it's uh, the the uh, <clears throat> Hannibal. Uh, you guys remember the stories of Hannibal? He's he's from Africa. He's going to he's in Carthage, and they're going to stage these magnificent. And, and really, Hannibal almost took over Rome, almost defeated Rome. It was on the footsteps. Was at the was basically on the uh, right outside of Rome and could have sacked Rome and ended the history of Rome right there. But history would have it that he would not take advantage of his position and ultimately he would be defeated. But those Punic Wars were happening during this time. Hannibal, uh, the, 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 one of the most fierce and feared and magnificent tacticians, literally almost took over Rome. And um, he was the one who invaded Rome from the north through the Alps. And do you remember from your history back in high school, some of the things he brought uh, in, into Italy, into northern Italy? He brought elephants. You guys remember that? He brought elephants and from the, you know, um, uh, literally up through the Alps, down through the Alps. Of course, many of them died, um, but he brought he brought, and, and of course, if you were an Italian uh, and you saw an elephant coming down at you, you, you would probably just give up. I would. Um, but he was a, a, mag a magnificent tactician. So when you think of the Punic Wars or Hannibal, this is happening this time. The Septuagint is being translated at this time in Egypt. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and then, of course, we have these events taking place with the Hasmonean dynasty. And, and so... Um, when the Hasmoneans, now, the, you know, as I mentioned before, the Hasmoneans got into some trouble um, and, and they became very disliked because they, they got power hungry and they started combining the office of high priest and king. And that, that really, really turned a lot of people off. And um, remember, who's the, who's the son it takes over from Matthias in the, in the, in the, and again, in this, again, we call it the Maccabean conflict. Who's the son that was called the hammer? Judas. He was Judas. He was the, he was the third son of Matthias. Uh, Matthias uh, Judas is going to die uh, fairly early in the conflict, but he's going to really just set the tone and, and begin to really create uh, and of course, we, we have Hanukkah. We, we mentioned, of course, he's going to restore the temple, rid, get, get rid of all of the Syrians, the Seleucids, and, but there's, there's constant fighting that's going on. And in the background, I want you to just keep in your mind, Rome is a burgeoning and powerful player on the platform of you know, not only Western Europe, but, but of course, in the Eastern provinces. So, so they are they have not yet laid stake or laid claim in Judea, but that's going to happen soon. Now, the Hasmoneans are going to lead us to an, a, a notorious, um, uh, nefarious, maybe is the better word, notorious, nefarious character in the, in the New Testament. And who is that? He's going to marry a Hasmonean princess. Hair the Great. So as you as you as you follow along, you may not get all the details, and that's okay. But the Maccabee, the, the Hasmonean dynasty, is going to lead us to Hair the Great. And so we'll show you some. I don't know if I did. I do that. Wow. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. Um, so here's what Israel looked like under the Maccabees. You can see here. These are territories that over time were were conquered by uh, some of, uh, some of uh, uh, Matthias' sons. You can see a certain part was, was captured by Judas, some by Jonathan, some by Simon. Um, but again, it, you know, o over a period of time, as the, as the Seleucid Empire just diminishes, um, the, the, uh, the, the Hebrews, of course, the Israelites, you know, obviously capture more land. And among those areas is Ijumea, 
or Idumea down here at the, at the south. Now, <clears throat> that's an important area because it's that area that's in the, of course, in the desert, it's in the Negev, but there's an important area right there that's right along the Dead Sea, um, and, and, and it's a, this is going to be where <clears throat> Herod the Great's father is from. This is where Herod's from. He was an Idumean or Idumean. And um, so, so from that name and from this location, who can tell me where this, these peoples come from? What, what, where, what does that name sound like? Can you get the name there? The Edomites, very good, very good. Edomites, you can see the name, how it's derived from this. This is Edom. And the capital of Edom, Petra, right. Of course, if you, if you know your Indiana Jones, You'll, you'll pick that up very quickly. Indiana Jones and uh, the Last Crusade. So you can see the, the temple there and Petra. So this is, this is where Herod is from. And uh, Herod's father, Antipur, Antipur uh, was a power player in this area. And, and so Herod, in order to, you know, to, to uh, Herod is going to be married as a young man to the Hasmonean princess marry me. Uh, and poor thing she was because she, she and her sons, um, what happened to them? You can only guess. <coughs> well, good things did not happen uh, around Herod. <clears throat> and so the Hasmonean princess that he marries um, as, a, as a young man um, is killed um, by Herod along with her two sons. Um, and so, um, so again, so as we, as we go through this Hasmonean period, we're beginning to see the landscape of the New Testament open before us. We're see, we're, and we'll, 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 again, we, I wish we could capture all of that, but, but this is as we go through. So 167, um, we have Matthias and his sons. We have the, really the beginning of the Maccabean conflict. Uh, we, the launch of this, remember, this guerrilla campaign to expel these Greeks. Um, and in 164, Judas gained the temple precepts. Now, there are some people that say that Judas was named high priest. There's some debate about that. Some, some people say, well, he was the first high priest of the Hasmonean period. But most believe that it's actually Jonathan that, that was the first high priest. But again, we see, that it's, we see this, this family and its heirs begin. And, and as you can see, Hellenism is, is, is creating this divide just like, you know, um, issues have divided, you know, the, the church today. I mean, there, there are issues that divide God's people today. And the Greek influence and, and, and all it meant was, it had a significant impact. And if you, one thing that, that I think is extremely valuable when you study the New Testament, when you study, you know, Jesus in Jerusalem, is the influence of Hellenism. In, in the days of, of Jesus himself. And one of the examples that I, you know, among many that we, we highlight is when Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. Um, and you know, what was going on around the pool of Bethesda? Well, there was the worship of a, God, a very popular Greek God by the name of Asclepius. Do you guys remember that? Remember, remember Asclepius? Remember what Asclepius's signature mark is? Yeah, a snake on the staff. It's what you see on doctor's offices all the time. He, Asclepius was a, a god that was, there's no question in the days of Jesus that there were, small, there were baths all around the pool of, of the Bethesda where people by the hundreds, maybe even thousands, would sit out waiting to be healed by the stirring of the water. Well, a lot of that was tied into Greek myth and, and Greek thought with regards to Asclepius and his ability to heal them. And when Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda, Jesus makes it very clear that I'm the one that's going to be healed you. It's not Asclepius. I'm the one who can pull you out of this place, not Asclepius. And Jesus makes it very clear by not touching this man. He tells him to get up and, of course, uh, leave this, take your mat and go to the temple, which he did because this man was, was in a pagan area. <laughs> yeah. Also, just made me think, the first real split in the Potential division in the church was the Hebrew Jews and the Hellenistic oh, Jews. 
That's exactly right. That's an excellent point. Yeah. I mean, what became very popular in, in Greek thought was, was in some part led to Gnosticism. I mean, just some of that concepts, uh, some of those concepts. So, yeah, and, and, uh, but, but it, it all starts here. It all starts here because, uh, you know, Greeks, again, the Sadducees would adopt these concepts. They, they would adopt this idea that, that God really isn't necessarily interested in the details or in your life. He's kind of separated. He's, it's, it's uh, you know, he's kind of up there in the sky, but he doesn't really care about you. Um, there is no resurrection. There are no angels or demons. Um, you know, he wants you to be, he wants you to do good deeds because he's this all-powerful God. So Yahweh takes on very much the image of Zeus. You guys follow me? So, so, you know, Yahweh in the mind of a, of a, uh, in the mind of a, of a, um, of a, of a Greek would have the characteristics of Zeus. And when you remember what were the characteristics of Zeus? Well, he would sit up and quibble up in, <laughs> up in the clouds. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, that was, that, that was God. He didn't care about the details. Um, and so uh, much of that concept kind of bled into, into America and other places. Um, do you guys remember the religion of many of our founding for, forefathers? Remember what they were, refer, they, what they were called? Deists. Yes, they were deists. You know what that is? What is deism? Right. And very much so the same thing we're talking about. This is a God who doesn't want to quibble with us down here on earth, um, uh, but it's, it's almost literally a separation. He doesn't care about us. I mean, he's, there is a God, but he's, he's, he, 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 he's got too many other affairs to deal with other than us. Um, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. I mean, he had some really bizarre conception but but again that again that I think all of that is connected in some way shape or form to this idea of the influence of of, of Hellenism so we have these um, yeah, again so you see Judaism being torn between these Hellenized Jews these Hasmoneans who were power hungry and then the Sadducees which of course were were really you know anything goes I mean they were concerned about the first five books of the Old Testament they did not believe in the oral law of the Old Testament. And so, but at the same time, they, they did not have any conception whatsoever of resurrection, uh, an afterlife, or of angels, angels and demons, and et cetera. So we talked about these, this underlying group, the, 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 the Hasidim, that would probably really constitute early Pharisaic, Pharisaicalism. So Pharisees... Uh, began to become the teachers, the, the rabbis of the, of the time. They were, they were definitely liked more than the Sadducees. Uh, and then, of course, you see some that are radical zealots. Some of Jesus' own apostles are, are zealots. So the Asmoneans have been more sympathetic to the Pharisees, or have is that not a time to make? Well, I, I think that... Um, they were very much so all about ridding, the, ridding themselves of the yoke of, of uh, they, they would definitely probably fall into the camp of Pharise Pharisaism than, than Sadducees. I mean, the Sadducees really open arms welcomed Antiochus. And it was, a, I mean, and, and, but they ruled, of course, later on, they would, the Sadducees would rule and hold power of the high priest chair. Um, but yeah, they would definitely be more inclined to fall in the line of the Pharise Pharisees. So the Roman period would begin in 63 BC, and at the end of the Hasmonean period, which I hope we can get to in this class, we'll show you kind of where Rome comes in and, and the role that they play. So again, just as a reminder, these are kind of the first, first few Roman emperors, many of whom you know. When you tell, we talk about Caligula and Tiberius, um, you know, Herod, uh, and Herod's sons uh, would, uh, well, Herod's sons particularly were friends with Caligula. Uh, in fact, Agrippa was friends with Caligula. Um, and, um, and, you know, when you, you guys remember, there was the triumvirate. We had, um, after Julius Caesar is killed, we have really kind of, you have Mark Antony, 
And then you have uh, Octavius, okay, the, the nephew of, of Julius Caesar. So you, you have these two powers. And who does Herod uh, the Great side with initially? Uh, Mark Anthony, wrong choice. <laughs> Uh, he sides with Mark Anthony initially. In fact, when he's building, when he's building the city of Jerusalem in the temple, he's going to name uh, a, a significant fortress that, that was right there in the, in the midst of the temple. He's going to name it after his friend Mark Anthony. And it's the Fortress of Antonia. The Fortress of Antonia was a, a fortress that, that was built by Herod that overlooked the Temple Mount. Um, when Paul is taken prisoner by Lysias, remember he's capped, he's taken up to the fortress, he's, taken up on, he's looking out over the temple when he speaks in Hebrew out to the people. So you see those influences of friends of Herod. Herod, after uh, Mark Anthony is defeated, of course, guess where he goes? He goes to Rome, and this is a really significant historical event. And it's, it, you should read about it because it's fascinating. Herod literally... I mean, sided with Mark Anthony this entire time. Augustus Caesar knows he did. And so he's going to go to Rome and literally put his life on the line. He goes before Augustus Caesar and says, Augustus Caesar, and this is what he says. And I'm going to summarize what he says. He says, listen, I was friends with Mark Anthony, and I sided with him. I'm a, I'm a true friend. Uh, but, I, I, but now you are my friend, and I will be a very reliable ally you, you remember this. You probably remember this when we were at Caesarea Maritima. I'll be a reliable friend to you. Um, and so he could have easily been killed and put someone else in place. But in fact, Caesar Augustus liked him and says, yeah, okay, go back. <laughs> I'll, I'll, make you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make you king of the Jews. And so that's what happens. So he goes back. But so, so Herod the Great has this interaction with both Mark Anthony uh, which is a really intertestamental period character and Herod the Great. So uh, all these people are going to be important. All, really, everybody here, I mean, you're going to see a lot of Paul's writings that are written during the time of Nero. Um, and, uh, of course, Tiberius is going to be the emperor during the time of Jesus himself. So uh, I'm going to kind of skip ahead. So one of the things that, that is important to note, and, and, and when many of you have heard this term, Tanakh, and it's, it's, it's Tanakh. So wh what does that word mean and, and what's its significance? Well, it's, a, it's really an anachronym in Hebrew that, that really constitutes, that describes the Old Testament. The Old Testament cons consisted of the Torah, the T and Tanakh, and then the, the, the Nevim, that's the N, that's the prophets, and then the Kedavim, the writings, and, and during this period of time, the Old Testament canon is forming. The Old Testament canon. So you have to ask yourself, well, when was the canon closed? And who can define for us what I mean by canon? You've, you've probably heard that term, the, the canonization or the, the canon, the, the, the New Testament canon. What, what do I mean by that? Accepted word of God. Right, so the canon would be, could be described as the, as the generally accepted uh, groupings of books or writings that were considered to be inspired. Um, it, it, they were, I mean, and obviously the Old Testament canon, uh, no canon was immediately known. I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't this process where, oh yeah, everybody knows which books are inspired. It took, it took time. Uh, the New Testament canon took some time to develop. Um, and it took time to develop because there wasn't emails. And, and you know, letters that Paul wrote had to get to one side of the you know, civilized world to the other side. Um, and so the Old Testament canon is happening during this place, during this period of time. And uh, so that's an important piece that's happening at this time as well. We talked about this, this idea of the Apocrypha. Um, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox use the Septuagint as their source of their Old Testament scriptures. Um, we as evangelicals, for the most part, hold the, the Masoretic text to be uh, more helpful to us. So where are we at in history? Well, we've, we've kind of gone all the way here. So we, if we start back at the United Kingdom with Solomon, 
um, you know, really being, of course, the, 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 the peak of the golden age of, Israelite, of the Israelite monarchy. It'd be around 1,000. And so fast forward, we're about 200. We're in the second century BC. We're in the 160s. And so look at all this, uh, the, this history that's led us to this point. And, and don't forget, you know, what's the role of the Sanhedrin in Jesus' life? <laughs> this massive. So think about this. In God's foreknowledge, do you think that God knew that Jesus would be condemned by the Sanhedrin? Do you think that that was part of his plan? Do you think it was part of his plan for Rome to be the one to execute him? Do you think that it was just all happenstance and it just all kind of happened or snowballed together by chance and randomness? You know, when Antiochus Epiphanes comes in um, and establishes, of course, his, his reign of terror, you know, the, the Jews have to form some type of senate. They have to form some type of legal body. So that's the, the beginnings of the Sanhedrin are taking place here. Um, and, and of course, it was based upon you know, Moses' call for 70 men or 70 elders. But what this group became was really a, a ruling senate for the Jewish people. They had tremendous power. Uh, they made great decisions. And then over a period of time, the Sanhedrin, there were smaller versions of the Sanhedrin in, vi in various villages and places outside of Jerusalem, usually consisting of 23 men. So if you were a Jewish village and you had over 123 people in your village, you had to have a Sanhedrin. Of course, it would be a smaller group of people. But think about the role of the Sanhedrin with Jesus. Of course, the Sanhedrin would, would consist of um, Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees dominated the aristocracy and the leadership of the Sanhedrin, but the Pharisees by far were, were higher in number. Um, and, and although we look at, you know, we, we use the word Pharisee today, we might as well just put that on the same page as a Nazi. I mean, there's nothing good you think of when it comes to Pharisees, but Pharisees were the most well-liked, and probably there were good ones. <laughs> there were good Pharisees who can, I mean, we, we know of some good Pharisees. You know, the ones that really kind of embraced Jesus, who were they? Nicodemus, who else? Paul was one, who else? Gamaliel, and you're missing one. Well, <laughs> remember the Sanhedrin, Pharisee, one of the secret disciples of Jesus. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, yeah. So, you know, were any of these guys Sadducees? No. They were all Pharisees. So why, why would a Pharisee be more likely to embrace Jesus? Well, because they were looking for a Messiah. They actually believed the prophet. They did. That's exactly right. They were, they were looking for a Messiah. But I will tell you, just like, you know, just like the Hasmonean dynasty, they, they, they got too involved with politics. They became power hungry. And they lost sight of really the, their purpose. I mean, they lost sight of, of what they were there for. And that was to lead people to be prepared for the Messiah. And so when Jesus stands out and, and he's looking out over Jerusalem before you know, Palm Sunday, and he weeps and he basically says, if you would have only known this day, if you've just been prepared. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, uh, Kyle did a wonderful job of helping us to understand Matthew 24 better. I mean, Jesus is standing there and he refers directly to Daniel. He's standing there talking about, um, you know, what was going to be a, a form or type of abomination of desolation that took place with um, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. And that, that type or form of, of, of annihilation or blasphemy would take place I think, you, as you adequately said, by the Romans. Um, and so, so here we are in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and what I want to do just real quickly, and I, I just, we're running out of time. So we, we talked about Onias. We talked about Menelaus. That's the, that's the guy that I mentioned before who would be the first uh, non-Levite to carry the role of the high priest. And um, there are many, many who thought that after him, when the Hasmoneans begin to take this role of high priest, 
There are still many that claim that they were illegitimate. However, I think the evidence suggests otherwise. And I, and I think the evidence suggests that they were, again, uh, what's interesting is that it's not easy to find. I mean, it, it took some digging to actually find information about that. So by the time you get to Jesus' day and you get to Annas and Caiaphas and all these are, are they? They are, they are of Levi. They, they are of <laughs> Levitical source, yeah. And if I said something different last time, I, I, I was wrong. They were very, very serious. I mean, when, when Menelaus takes that role, that's right in the middle of Antiochus Epiphany. He was, he was in Antiochus Epiphany's back pocket. I mean, he was a real... You know, he was a, a, a real despot. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, Annas, um, Caiaphas, by all accounts, connected to the Levitical priesthood. Well, probably more Zadok. I mean, you know, that, his line seems to have been the one that really kind of carries through this latter, latter part of the priesthood. But Zadok was Aaronic, right? Yeah, yeah, he was connected to the Aaron priesthood. So how did he become such a cat? Sorry, well, I think it was because of David. Okay. I think that he was a key player in David's kingdom. And so I, I think that that's where he took on that, that role. Um, okay, so these are the things that happened here. The persecution, Sabbath was outlawed, pagan altars established, Jews forced to eat swine, altar to Zeus put in the temple. The true abomination of desolation. This is, what, this is what happens here. We talked about Judas. And then we talked about, of course, so this is where I wanted to get to. And you, you may not or may not be able to see this, but what I want you to just kind of notice here, we have Matthias there, and then we have his five sons. And Jonathan's going to really be kind of the first high priest. You see that high priest down there on the label. Um, and then John Hyrcanus is a huge character um, that... Um, that has a lot of significance because of his, I mean, he was a ruthless guy um, and takes on really kind of the combination of high priest and, and king. But again, kind of winds your way down through, through, through history. Um, and, you know, some of these characters we've talked about, Aristobulus, um, Alexandra actually was, uh, was actually kind of ruled Jerusalem for quite a few years. She's a female, a woman. Um, she ruled because... Uh, of a, a death of her husband. Uh, she marries his brother. So she reigns for a while, and it's her son, Aristobulus II, who uh, has made this, made this, again, priest, king. But so we, we work our way down. So what happens here? Aristobulus II. Well, there was civil wars going on left and right. If you, if you think this looks you know, like it, everything was just going smooth and every, no one was fighting or killing each other. This was awful. I mean, this, this makes the northern kingdoms mess. Remember at the end of the northern tribes? This, this I mean, that, this is major Jerry Springer stuff. I mean, they're really dysfunctional people. And so at, at some point, Rome comes into play. Pompey uh, is going to come in at 63 BC and he sees the mess that's going on and he he kind of comes in as this, you know, this massive, you know, power player comes in and he kind of sets the house in order. And, you know, he's the one who kind of, you know, blesses the Hasmonean period, the Hasmonean dynasty. And then it, right here at the very end, you see Herod, Herod and, and Mary Me were, were, were married as young people, probably as kids. They were connected. At one point, they have to, they, they go to Rome they actually spent quite a bit of time in Rome together. And that's where the relationship began with uh, Antony and, and Octavius. Uh, and so during that period of time, he, they're eventually going to come back. He's going to reign for a period of time. And he's going to be, uh, uh, again, allied with uh, Mark Antony until he's not. Um, and Mark Antony is killed, of course, him and and his lover at the time, Cleopatra, yes, the same Cleopatra that marries Julius Caesar, um, they're, they're going to commit suicide together. Uh, and there's lots of really good movies about that stuff if you want to catch one. You may actually get a kernel of truth in there, so probably not much. But this is, Her this is where Herod, now why would Harry, Herod, why would he be married to a Hasmonean princess? What was the purpose of that? power. 
I mean, so if you're, if you're not a Jew, what's the next best thing? Marry a Jew. But not just any Jew, a Hasmonean. She was a true princess. I mean, this was a, this was a powerful family. Um, and so they're going to have two children. And, and both of their children will be killed because of the paranoia of Herod. Was that first or second? Or first. Okay. And what's interesting is, is that um, one of those children is going to have a child and his, he would be Agrippa I. Agrippa I would actually be connected to the Hasmonean family indirectly. So if you wonder, you know, uh, of course, uh, Agrippa I is mentioned in the New Testament along with Agrippa II. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so, so again, all this is kind of connected to the family here. And we talked about, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the Septuagint being written around this time. And, and of course, the, the books of 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Maccabees are included in uh, that period of time. Um, in, in, of course, in the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha, unfortunately, was added to uh, some, tra some, some translations of the Septuagint. So the, Apoph the, Apo Apo the <laughs> Apocrypha uh, was uh, part of the Septuagint. <clears throat> um, but in no way, shape, or form was, was it, were these books, any of these books, accepted as, as canon, uh, as part of the, again, the accepted books inspired by God. No, no Jew at, at any point accepted these books, but they were kind of lumped into them. And so as I mentioned, when, when Jerome comes along uh, and, and translates, the, uh, translates the Bible from that Hebrew into Latin, um, he's going to be kind of strong-armed into including the uh, Apocrypha, among which are these books of the, the Maccabees. Someone tell me something that I'm, I mean, I, I, guys, this is major 30,000 feet. I mean, we're, there's so much intrigue and so much just amazing. I mean, the, the, the story of Antiochus Epiphanes, you know, the story about him coming in and meeting Lysias, the Roman the Roman general that kind of had the small cohort in Alexandria. And, and I mean, Antiochus Epiphanes had an army four times bigger than that of the Roman army there. They, just spent a, they sent a small contingent. And uh, the, this Roman leader, Lysias, walks, o walks over, and this is a famous historical story, and draws a circle around Antiochus Epiphanes in the dirt. Uh, and he, he says that, you know, before you leave the circle, you need to decide whether you're going to do one way or the other, because if you leave the circle, you have declared war on Rome. It's a great story. Josephus records it. The book of, I think, Maccabees records these events. But, I mean, it's, 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 it's really Ridley Scott gladiator stuff written all over it. <clears throat> so it's really fascinating, uh, th these events that take place. But I think the thing to take away from the Maccabean conflict is that they were corrupt. And even though their initial goal was to, was to rid Israel of, of, of paganism and Hellenism, Hellenism was there to stay. And, and they grew to accept a great amount of what Antiochus Epiphanes and others had intended. You know, they, they did not destroy the, the hippodromes in the city or the theaters. Those things existed in the Jesus time. Uh, and when you think of Jesus walking around Jerusalem, you don't think of him walking next to a, you know, walking next to a theater or walking next to a hippodrome, but he did. There was Greek influence everywhere around Jesus, everywhere. And, um, and, and, and again, we've talked about that the, you know, the, 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 the Old Testament that he's reading from as a, as a, when he goes back to Nazareth and he's sitting there in the synagogue and when he's reading about himself, he's reading from the Septuagint. <laughs> There's no question about it. He's reading from the Septuagint. Um, but I think the thing to take away from this is that, again, all of these events really kind of set the stage for those who side with Hellenism, the Sadducees, those who are more traditional yet, uh, and again, that are going to really kind of take on the role of teachers and rabbis, and that's the Pharisees. Um, and then you're going to see, and again, the Pharisees 
are going to be ones that are going to adopt the oral law and believe in the oral law. And, um, and, and so, again, we're setting the stage for Rome. And um, our next class, <clears throat> let me look at our date here. Okay, the 17th. So um, our next class is going to be, again, we're going to pick up from the Maccabean and pick up Rome. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about Rome and their influence here and what happens and how that kind of brings us to, you know, the reason why Pilate is procurator, what that means. And then, and then we're going to have a couple classes on the literature of the intertestamental period, which includes the Apocrypha and the Septuagint, which we've already given you guys, you know, some, some good food for thought. Thank you. See you guys. See you guys Sunday.